Denim Couch Podcast. Whoa, whoa. Whoa, whoa. The 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s with Steph with an F. Hi, guys. Welcome to the Denim Couch Podcast, where we chill on this denim couch and talk about the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. I'm Stephanie Tanner. Welcome. Hey guys, it's Stephanie Tanner with the Denim Couch Podcast. Welcome to another episode. I have You're So Vain. You probably think this song is about you. You're so vain. (laughs) Stuck in my head right now. All day. All day it's been stuck in my head. This week is going to be kind of a different format. So we've interviewed so many awesome people And you've heard so many awesome stories from people's experiences through the 40s and 50s. And all I know is I've taken away so much more than I expected. I set out to answer this question that has been going through my mind consistently for months now, which is were people back in the day generally happier than we are today? Um, So like I said, I've taken away a ton from this from this experience. And my favorite thing has got to be so far just the interviews. I just enjoy interviewing people about their experience. And so I'm kind of sad because in this interview, I'm actually not interviewing someone. This is more of a recap, but also tying in embarrassing stories and recapping the 40s and 50s here in this episode. Um, Why you say, well, I really enjoy embarrassing stories. And okay, to start off with, I, um, yeah, I just want to talk about some of those things that I've learned and then we're going to dive right into embarrassing stories from back in the day and from right now. Now, one of the questions I ask every single interviewee is what is, is technology a good or bad thing? And all of the answers have been very similar and, and my answer is pretty much the same thing. Well, it's good and bad. We're all aware of this, even the people who may not use it that much. Now, the people I've interviewed, um, many of them are on social media and, you know, they check out, check in on their grandkids and they enjoy it and they post and others, others have not stepped foot on it. <laughs> okay, so this article from the Chicago Tribune by... Gregory Karp in 2006, which is long before um, what I'm getting at here. But he, um, because I think the problem has significantly increased since we got apps on our phone, Um, since Instagram, which I love, and Facebook and whatever else you want to name, there's millions of them, um, apps became a thing. And it's used for good and bad. So I like, I like what this article says. It says, an intense impulse to consume immediately serves us well in times of scarcity. But, but in an era of overabundance, coupled with the availability of technology, it's, it's because of how we're wired. Our consuming nature doesn't have an off switch or at least it's hard to reach. So only the most disciplined among us can repeatedly tell ourselves no to all the consuming opportunities we're bombarded with today. Um, man, that is so true. Balance and self-control are not our strong suits, at least my generation is. I, I do meet a lot of people who are very good at controlling their use of social media and making sure they limit it and only use it for certain things. But I personally am not that person and many people I know are not that person. Um, I do think it's a huge issue that we all struggle with this consuming nature and this addiction because of multiple things, because of multiple... (laughs) his addiction from multiple facets 
of technology. It's the fear of missing out, also known as FOMO. It's the, which is a huge one. I feel this all the time. If I, you know, don't know what's going on with my friend's posts or with this post or, you know, if I haven't checked this in so many hours, I feel like I'm missing out. Boredom. We need to be constantly, you know, I think we all feel bored if we don't have something to read or something to, we can't just sit. Our generation and today's people have the hardest time just sitting and thinking or creating without this pre-made entertainment. And we constantly need to consume some type of entertainment. This technology is just so addicting to us because it gives us a small sense of gratification. It's instant gratification. We are addicted to the likes and the val. We we've put this huge value on on media. Many of us are posters, and we are affected greatly by the response that we get from posting and we value this and it's interesting because I've had to overcome this through posting even with this podcast nice thing is is I could care less about my personal Instagram and I have now gotten to the point where I don't care that much I still value um, what is happening with my (laughs) denim couch Instagram but I am working so hard Um, it's a mental game, to not value what is going on statistically with my Instagram. So, I mean, we value this, the stats and the likes and the, the credit and the response that we get from our posts. And in a sense, there should be nothing wrong with that other than we are valuing it too much. Now we are to the point where we value how many likes we got on a page or how many views we got on this post or this video. And these are all great marketing stats. I actually am a fellow marketer and these all interest me very much. But for my self-confidence and for um, for me to avoid this addiction, I cannot value these posts and think, why am I on here? Is it for the instant gratification? Is it because I value these likes and I need these likes and this response and this this attention? Because let's be real, they make us feel great. The problem is it's just instant gratification. It's not long lasting. It's not actually satisfying. I've come to learn that the things that these people talk about that's most important to them is what brings true satisfaction which is relationships. It's connecting with people. You can still be a part of social media and connect with people and not value your likes and your posts. You can make it about the people that you're connecting with. You can make it about them and saying hi to them and building that relationship and making them feel valued. But you don't need to value. It's about supporting the people around us those who are sad and depressed, those who are happy. It's about supporting the people that need your support. And one hindrance of the addiction of technology and being on social media apps all the time is that we are losing the connections. I have noticed, I personally, I mean, this is all from personal experience. I do think it applies to every other person I know The more you spend on technology, on your phone, you're disconnecting. Have you heard the saying, like, disconnect to connect? We're all going to be dealt with hard situations. That's a given. This life is not easy. It It never was supposed to be, and it's never going to be. So we've got to learn to adjust, you know? We've got to stop scrolling and numbing our feelings Because that's what we do to cope with these hard things. We've got to adjust. We've got to face it. We, you know, we've got to make life more fun. 
create your entertainment. The other day, I made a point to I tried to think like my kid and do something my kid would enjoy. And so we got these hair ties and flung hair ties at the ceiling. That was probably the funnest thing I have done in months. And it didn't require a phone. And I think it was fun because it wasn't about the phone. It wasn't about the the technology. It wasn't about the approval or the instant gratification. It was about spending quality time with my son and doing something creative. I want to make sure my son knows how to create his own fun because he's a kid and I'm his example. And how am I, I going to teach my kid that technology and, and apps and social media and instant gratification is not ultimately that satisfying? It's just an addiction you have to continue to fulfill. I want him to use it and I want him to know how to use it, but I want him to be able to control himself and live in the real world while using social media. And then I've also realized, yes, I want that for him and I want that for me and I still haven't even mastered it and I'm not close, but I'm getting there. So tonight, (laughs) tonight we danced in the kitchen for about half an hour. I turned on my record player and I went up and down the steps and did different moves and I focused on the steps and I made the steps a game. And I have not done anything like that in months. And it's stupid and it's creative and I made my own damn fun. How can we be kind to the Eeyores in our life when we're so focused on the busyness and the technology and social media and the approval that we need and the instant gratification once again that we need and the addiction that we're trying to fulfill? We spend so many hours a day, if you're anything like me, I spend so many hours a day on these, on these apps. It's not always Instagram. In fact, my Instagram time has gone way down. It's YouTube and videos and work. Daria has um, such a great story of mental illness, which brings me to the anxiety and the pressure and the the busyness, the mental anguish that we feel um, so much more prevalent, prevalently um, nowadays. And it was a problem back in the day, but I do think it's more prevalent now because we are just so bombarded by technology and by the messages and by everything thrown at us and needing to be constantly entertained and not using um, our creative brains as much. And I do think that's affecting us. It's been proven in multiple studies that that's affecting our mental health. So mental health is so important. and, And if only, and I can only use my personal experiences, but when I slow down, slowing down is something I have to majorly work on and, and put some serious self-control into. I am a busy bee. I want to be informed. I want to be, to be constantly in the know, constantly entertained by multiple sources. I want to work, but the anxiety runs rampant, man, because we're not relaxing. We're overthinking the crap out of everything that the times where I am dancing in the kitchen, making my own game with the steps are the times when I feel the least anxious and the most peaceful. I have some vintage as well as current stories, um, embarrassing stories that I would like to share with you to end this. But also one of my thoughts has been that you know, there are the occasional creative people out there who do really cool things like embarrassing family photos or they plan activities, but not a lot of people do that anymore. And with these embarrassing stories, I also have a, can create our own fun without our phones, 
connecting in real life is more fun than connecting online. The point is, is I'm losing connection with my family. I'm losing connection with my friends without even knowing it by not planning activities, by not planning dinner parties, by not dancing in the kitchen, by not throwing rubber bands at the ceiling. I'm losing connection because our time is temporary. And without even knowing it, the instant entertainment at my hands is conflicting with the time that I have to build these relationship. So here's some dang good embarrassing stories from yours truly, from my cousin, from a few good friends, and from the internet. Embarrassing stories are like the unexpected highlights or in some cases lowlights of your life. And I'm a super nostalgic person if anyone knows me. I mean I am doing a podcast about the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. Um, even though I didn't live with live back then, um, and so I, I feel like we tend to remember things that are either habits in our life or things that completely surprised us. And unexpected events are something that I think stick with us and stand out from the ordinary things in our life, and therefore we remember them better. And between you and me, I really like the uncomfortableness of an embarrassing situation. Not in the moment, but it it's kind of exciting. Um, it makes me feel alive, even though it makes me feel extremely uncomfortable. And let's just say it makes a great story to tell later on. Along with unexpected embarrassing moments, I like unexpected and creative activities. And I actually think these are the best ways to get your family and friends to connect. I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but I mean, we all need a little push to step outside our comfort zones. And right now, it seems like our comfort zones are our screens. So connection is something that I find myself, and I would say most people struggle with. Um, what is better than connecting with family members or friends, find, connecting with an old friend, having a conversation that's meaningful and that brings two people or more together is so amazing. That is joy right there. And, and at the end of the day, I, I have to say that to me is what's most important. And to most of the people I have interviewed, that's what we all, I think, have come to find. Okay, Glenn, we're going to read some embarrassing stories like we did that one time, but we're going to do it again. The same nipple pimples. Pimples. Yes. Do you want to come closer? All right, so Glenn and I are going to read some other people's embarrassing stories because it's fun, and it's funny, and we, well, I enjoy it. I don't know. He probably enjoys it, too. Um, And then tell us some of our own embarrassing stories. What kind of people does that make us? Is what he just asked. Um, I don't know. I maybe I have a dark sense of humor or sense of joy. <laughs> earlier, I was okay. Well, earlier I was saying how I uh, I really like like in the moment I don't like to be uncomfortable, but I kind of like it. Oh, like, like I get a high, the, like I get a high who, off of awkwardness yeah. and like uncomfortable. Yeah, there's people who thrive in awkward, and then there's people who cower from awkward. And... But but I wouldn't say like I like it. I don't I don't want. Oh, I it. love it. I love. Well, I like awkward. it like after, like five minutes after, I love it. <laughs> but d- in the middle of it, it's uncomfortable, you know. But I love it five minutes after, because it already happened and it's over. But now I can think about how awkward it is. <laughs> <laughs> you can re- replay it in your head. Exactly. Like right exactly. After. Okay, so <laughs> let's let's read some of these. Okay. You read this first one, right? Yeah. Okay. When I was seven or eight, and these are from this one's from a site called 22words.com. Um this B B underscore Busby 
says, when I was seven or eight, I thought being a teenager was the absolute coolest thing that would ever happen to me. I'd use my mom's lipstick to paint fake pimples on my face so people might think I was a teenager. That's awesome. Ooh, okay, this your turn. This one is by Captain Magic Trouser, Trousers. Captain Magic Trousers. In middle school, I wore a plaid suit jacket that was my dad's from the, night, from the 70s. I thought it was hilarious and a so ugly it's cool sort of way, but I probably just seemed desperate for attention. <laughs> you imagine like a little kid just like, <laughs> like in the seventies plaid jacket that's like probably really bright, bright blue and yellow or something. Oh, gross. Oh. It's like it's a vintage cool, but really you're just getting the looks like what are you <laughs> it, doing? It might dude? be cool if you're like twenty or thirty Ooh, in a bad. vintage sort of cool way, but you're in what? Middle school. <laughs> I actually had a friend who wore um, like a full on suit and he brought a, um, this was so awesome. I won't say his name, but he, he thought he was so cool and he looked like such a, such a dork, but we loved him. Um, he brought his briefcase, a matching black <laughs> briefcase and his black full on suit, um, tie, white shirt and slacks polished shoes every day uh for like a week yeah oh yeah yeah he watched some movie <laughs> like men in black or something yeah oh oh and before this i i'd like to tell this story actually before this um i changed my child's diaper in the room and glenn came in to chat with us <sighs> and i had shoved the diaper <laughs> <laughs> in uh in a towel because it smelled so bad and i was gonna take it out but I had been busy, and so I didn't, so I, it was on my to-do list. So Glenn comes in, and he's laying down on the floor and uses this towel <laughs> as a pillow <laughs> and instantly goes, man, it stinks in here. Did he Did you change his diaper, or did he crap himself? And <laughs> like, no, you're, uh, you're laying on it. <laughs> so gross. So All right. nasty. Okay, so this is, I was a total nerd during my teen years in the 80s. Bottle top glasses, computer and science magazines, terribly matched hand-me-down clothes, got bullied a lot by the jocks in my class, etc. But for some reason, despite the fact that I was as stiff as an ironing board, I spent hours practicing breakdance routines to Herbie Hancock's Rocket. Everything from robot to shoulder wave to caterpillar to helicopter spins. Dreaming of the day I would get to shine in front of the popular kids. <laughs> it's from Nation Crafting on this site. Um, yeah, I thought that was good because break dance routines. I'm just oh, yeah. that's just the best. What better way to one up the popular kids than break dance than your way to oh, like start for, sure. for sure. Yeah. And that's just a cool kid. I, I like that. <laughs> I like that a lot. I want to be friends with them. And this one's from Spartan2842. He said, My friend and I had just finished watching Back to the Future. I thought it would be awesome to get an, to get on our skates and grab the bumper of a morning vehicle to pull us around. We go to the corner of our street, and the first car that pulls up is a Jeep Grand Cherokee. It stops at the sign and goes to take a right. I grab onto the rear bumper and it pulls me. <laughs> I'm thinking I'm the coolest kid ever for a moment. Suddenly, the Jeep stops and the driver door opens. It was my mom, and she just starts screaming at me for being dumb enough to, true, to try this. She had taken her car into service, and this Jeep was the rental for the day. Such an embarrassing moment. Back to the Future is ruined for me now. <laughs> <laughs> hey, the kid got away with it for a yeah. little while, which is pretty cool, actually. Right. And dangerous. I don't recommend it, but. That's awesome. So, Char92474, got to give credit. This is from BuzzFeed. Um, had, <laughs> this is what they said. When I was a little boy and was finished potty training, my mom asked me if I ever tried going to the bathroom standing up. And I answered, I tried once, but the poop fell on the ground. <laughs> Apparently no one explained to me you can only pee standing up. I'm 45 and my mom still brings this up anytime anyone says anything about potty training. <laughs> Poor guy. <laughs> oh man. <clears throat> so I'm probably not going to read the next one, um, but it was about Disney, and it actually reminded me of my dis first Disney experience, which was a super embarrassing story, for me at least. It was kind of um, traumatic, sort of. So like we walk into Disney in California, and you know how there's like all those flowers on the hill? Mm-hmm, yeah. When you yeah, 
enter. Wow. Everyone takes pictures there. Yeah. Yeah. That spot, we walk right in. We are not close to any rides. We just got there. And a bird pooped on my head, like <laughs> right on my head. And it was a lot of poop. Oh it was it was more than the average it was like bird an egg poop. Crack. It was like oh. full on egg on my head. And I just flipped out. Like, I, I mean, you know, I'm like, what? I don't know, eight years old. And I've got bird poop all over my head. And we haven't even gone on any rides. So I cried and tried to get them to take me back so I could wash my hair. And they wouldn't do it. They were like, we have four other kids. We're not getting back on that bus. We're going. We're already in. You know, suck it up. So I put a, one of those uh, bucket hats. They gave me oh, a bucket hat. bucket hat to hide the, the bird poo. I had a hibiscus bucket <laughs> hat to hide the bird poo. And I felt so disgusting the whole time. Nasty. It is pretty gross. Ooh. Oh, man. Um... Well, like walking out of the gym or locker room in my shoe out with my boxers on accident. <laughs> like that wasn't on purpose. <laughs> yeah, because anything you would do that is embarrassing would usually be trouble. on purpose though. Yeah. Like you do things on purpose. <laughs> yeah, I get in trouble for that. Like if it was on pur- um, embarrassing on purpose. Um Okay, so this happened to me a lot in high school, actually. I would go to sleep, and an hour later... <laughs> no, I've never woken up in the middle of the night and gotten dressed for school. How did you know I was going to say that? <laughs> because I remember you did that. You were all done already. Like, why isn't anybody else awake? I had, I had like, done... I had full-on taken a shower and blow-dried blow my hair. <laughs> no, it was... I went to sleep at 11 and woke up at midnight. So oh I had only gosh. slept an hour, and I felt, like, fully rejuvenated. <laughs> <laughs> I had taken a shower, blow-dried my hair, and then um, then was eating a full bowl of Cheerios. I had all my makeup on. My dad came in and was like, what are you doing <laughs> eating Cheerios? <laughs> I was like, you know it's not the morning. Anyways, so then I had to go back to sleep, and my makeup got all ruined. Happy. You never had that happen? No. My, I like, I don't know if I got locked out of my house and just my boxers. Why? Just in the summer, for some reason, I ran out for the car because I forgot, like, I think my shorts were in the car and it was late and it, I think it was, it was like 9 30. And what happened? Yeah, like, I went, I ran out, but for some reason, they thought like we were all inside, so they locked the door. So I was freezing outside and everybody else was like, they're all downstairs in the basement <laughs> with a red house. And so I was like 12 years old, just like freezing my butt off in my boxers. <laughs> For like half an hour, I was banging on the windows in the basement. Like, That's funny. Get up. Did anyone see you? Yeah, finally. They were like, where's Glenn? <laughs> they heard me banging on the window. I asked what a thong was. That was embarrassing. <laughs> Because I didn't know what a thong was in eighth grade. And so in history class, and I was like, Miss Prasad, what's a thong? Just randomly? Well, because someone said it in the hallway during passing period. Did and you I was think it like, was historical? No, I didn't know what it was. Like, I was like, because they were talking like it was normal. So I was like, what's a thong? Like, Miss Prasad, <laughs> what's a thong? And she looked at me, she's like, principal's office now. Because she thought I was being, like, you know, facetious. Facetious, yeah, facetious. But I legit had no clue what a thong was. That's great. <laughs> so then the principal, Miss Ridenour, is like, Glenn, are you just, what are you? I was like, I don't know what it is. Like, someone said it in the hallway. That was pretty embarrassing. That is. I got, I got detention for that one. That is so embarrassing. I didn't know what a thong was. I asked my history teacher. Okay, I'm going to end it with someone else's embarrassing story and then. Look forward to some other conversations that I'll just attach to the end of this podcast for your entertainment. Um, okay, this is from Emily's 44B025 DC4. Wow. Um, when I was 11 and my sister was 13, my parents brought, 
bought a huge motorhome. We parked at a Walmart overnight, and in the morning, my sister and I started taking a shower. She went in first, and I sat naked on the closed toilet seat to wait for my turn. However, two ladies saw our motorhome and asked my parents to see the inside, and my parents obliged. Well, being a dumb kid, I forgot to lock the door of the motorhome, so next thing I know, the door is being ripped open, and a complete stranger saw me and my sister butt freaking naked. Worse for me, because at least my sister was in a frosted glass shower, and I was the roly-poly type of child all out in the open. I think the woman was equally embarrassed as I was. I locked the door and sat in there listening to the other woman cry because our motorhome was so beautiful. I was so grateful when they left. Lady, if you're out there and you recognize the story, I'm sorry you had to see me like that. <laughs> oh, that'd be funny, though. I had, okay, so I was reading these the other night and I thought it was really funny, but it might not be funny now. I don't know. <laughs> okay. Yeah. It's so weird because they pop into my mind randomly throughout life and I go, oh man, wish I never did that. But when I try to think of an embarrassing story, I can't think of any. Yeah. I'm like, I, oh, I have so many. And then I couldn't think of any. I don't get it. I don't know how that works. No. Like it's all like there the has time. to be a farting story that I just really don't like. But. And there's some that you just want to <laughs> die. They're so bad. And oh, those yeah. ones I can't remember. Oh, I remember them. So I wouldn't repeat them. <laughs> there's like a level I will repeat back. Like there's a certain level I will actually share. But when it gets to a certain point, I'm like, I'm never going to let you know that ever. <laughs> okay, so this this is Glenn's, which I guess we were talking about, but someone else had the same thing happen. So okay, so I'll just say it. My husband went, my husband placed an order at the drive-thru. And then she then heard, could you drive up to the speaker? You're talking to the trash can. Glenn has done this like five times. That's awesome. <laughs> and then this is another one of Glenn's, which I guess he could say, but yeah, I don't know if he'll actually do it. So he told me that when he was six, he thought magic was real. So he decided to tie himself upside down with his foot, <laughs> <laughs> foot up, tied with the bathrobe belt. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So he was like Houdini about to perform a trick, actually saying something like, I'm Houdini in his head. <laughs> and so then, Glenn. yeah, right? That's so Glenn. And then the next thing you know, he had spun himself around too many times and he couldn't reach the knots. So he starts screaming for his life and then he realized he was screwed. So he started bawling his eyes out, and then his dad came, <laughs> and he, he was, like, running towards him, and he stopped, and he's like, hold on, hold on, just a second, and then he went and got his camera and took a bunch of photos of him. That is pretty embarrassing. Yeah. How old is he? Did it say? Uh, oh, he was six. six. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <gasps> Which one? I walked out of the middle of the school gym without any shorts on, and I walked out of the gym in my silky boxers. Is that Glenn? Yeah. He wore silky boxers? Yes. Like and <laughs> when? Middle school? Middle school. Oh, that's, that's embarrassing. the embarrassing part. That's embarrassing. Yeah, just the boxers <laughs> yeah. is embarrassing. Oh, gosh. Uh, oh, gym is so rough in middle school. <laughs> I remember I was going through a phase, and I started out the year wearing this like you only get like one shirt a year or yeah. two shirts well I gained weight <laughs> because I was a chubby kid and by the end of the year people had to help me take my shirt off I had to put my arms up and they had to take the shirt I don't know why I didn't just get a new shirt it was that tight it's so embarrassing I'm sorry that you had to I'm, well, I'm you. sorry I didn't tell my mother I bet if I told my mom that my shirt was that tight she would have replaced it especially during that time in my life oh, of things no. were happening to me oh no that's embarrassing I'm sorry I hate Jim that one is bad I <laughs> I just one time I was really slow and I couldn't I really couldn't run fast because, like, again, I was chubby. And so, but I thought in my heart that I was athletic. I really did. I was convinced I was this athlete. So this boy <laughs> who's really cocky, we were playing, like, capture the flag. He started running with the flag or whatever. And I was like, I'm going to catch that guy. <laughs> so I started chasing him. 
and he just looked behind him. He's like, what is she doing? <laughs> and I was going full force, like beat red, sweating, and I wouldn't stop chasing him, but he was like jogging at this point. <laughs> and he just was like, okay. <laughs> oh. Did you catch him? No, I didn't catch it. I was so embarrassed after that. I was like, oh, I really am slow. <laughs> gotcha. But anyways, um, <laughs> uh, one time I, there's this really cute guy I'd known since I was like five years old, he's gone in my school. And I, I wore for a while, these really classy button up shirts every day. <laughs> Cause I wanted to be a professional middle school woman okay and what I did not realize is that the whole time I, I got the guts to talk to him after school and so I walked up to him and I was like hey Troy how's it going <laughs> so I was trying to make conversation the whole time my little my button was unbuttoned <laughs> Oh, my cleavage area with my little middle school boobies, okay? And I didn't know it. <laughs> and then the whole time he was smiling at me, and I thought, oh my gosh, he really likes me. But he was just thinking <laughs> that my shirt was open, and I didn't know. So I have weird. never heard that one. Oh, it was bad. I, I was that. so proud of myself. Oh. I was walking back to the bus, and I was oh, like, no. I talked to the boy I liked. And I saw my reflection in something, and I was like, oh, I wanted to die. I just wanted to die. My little <laughs> middle school bra. Oh, it's terrible. <laughs> the same. <laughs> so, soccer trip, freshman year. We go to talk about and bend, which. <laughs> but, like, I show up, and the rest of our soccer team, so we were co ed. So, all the rest of the seniors and the juniors and all of us walk in and I'm a little freshman. Also, my dad was there for some random reason. I think he was driving and my brother. So you know what? I'm just leading the posse. And we go in there and I walk up and I'm the first one. I'm like, I'm just from Mexican pizza. Maybe a drink. And they're like, oh yeah, is that for here to go? I'm like, oh, it's for here to go. <laughs> no, is that for here to go? It's for here to go. <laughs> sorry do you want that here or to go and my dad leans in and he's like she wants it for here I'm like I don't even know what I said <laughs> and then everyone is laughing and you know what every time we go somewhere now my family is like oh it's for here to go and they just confuse everyone so <laughs> I started a movement it's for here to go yeah I can see how you do that mm -hmm. but so, first, no kindergarten, I was in the Sims Redox, first, kindergarten, first grade, Lauren, she had a bathroom in her classroom. No, I remember that bathroom. The rule is you can't lock the door because it doesn't unlock. Once it's locked, it doesn't unlock. So, everybody was getting ready to go to PE, and I had to go to the bathroom, so I went to the bathroom, and for some reason, the whole class left without me. But I had locked the door because I forgot. And there I was stuck in the bathroom. I don't I wasn't in there long, but the hero of the story is David Bolt because <laughs> he couldn't go to pee because he had broken his leg. <laughs> Thank heavens for that. For some reason, like he was in the classroom still. I don't know where Miss Rebach was, but I was in the bathroom and I was like, no one is here. And then David Bolt did come back into the classroom and I was like, I am stuck in the bathroom. Can somebody go find Mrs. Rebach so I can get out? And <laughs> Mrs. Rebach can't get it open because it's like it's broken and the, the lock is broken. So they had to get the janitor and hinge off the entire door. <laughs> Here I am. Just I was probably crying. I was so sensitive. And I remember as if being locked in the bathroom isn't embarrassing enough, I would stand up in front of the class with David Bolt as the hero of the story and be like, everybody, Mackenzie locked your story. And David saved her. Yay. <laughs> you have to buy attention to me. <laughs> oh, that's a good story. I like how they had to get, like, take the entire board. Yeah,
Alrighty, so I like how your guys' stories are all from when you were like, oh, like first grade, and oh mine God. are like, wow, last year. <laughs> <laughs> um, but so last year, um, my friend was getting married in Arizona, and yes. So basically, I was a bridesmaid. I was traveling with another bridesmaid and her husband. And they messaged me before. Or she, sorry, she was getting married in California. That's the whole point of the story. She was definitely getting married in California. And so <laughs> the other bridesmaid, yeah. So the other bridesmaid uh, messages me and she's like, oh, you know what? If we get your ticket too, then we get this super sweet discount. So we're just going to book it for us all three to go to California. I'm like, sweet. I'm not even going to worry about it. So like, I don't really even get a confirmation. I don't get anything like that. I go to the airport. I put in my name. I get my ticket. Meanwhile, Salt Lake Airport is just a crap show, basically. Like, there are people missing all their flights. There's so many delays. It's just a mess. And so I got there super early, trying to be responsible or whatever. And so I am just with on the phone with the bride and the other bridesmaid and her husband who are stuck. And like, I'm just on the phone constantly. I'm just, you know, I'm like, there's the gate. I just go to the gate. And I'm just on the phone, figuring everything out. And I get on the plane. I'm like, sweet. I'm on the plane. They missed their flight. I'm like, okay, well, I guess I'll just go do this by myself. They'll catch another flight. So I get, I get there and I go through security, get off the plane, all that stuff. And I'm just starving. <laughs> and so I go to, I, I call my husband. I'm on the phone with Josh walking through the airport looking for a hamburger because dang, that sounded so good. And so I'm like, Josh, there's a ton of cactus crap all over this airport. Are there like a lot of cactuses in California? And he's like, no, I don't think there's a lot of cactuses in California. I'm like, dang, they've got Mexican Indian stuff everywhere. I am just like, this is not what I remember. Mind you, I have been out of security for at least a half an hour. <laughs> it has been a minute. I'm just walking around. I'm like, super weird. They changed this airport. And I'm on the phone with Josh. And I'm like, no, no. And I pull out my ticket. And I'm just like, Josh, I am going to miss my next flight. I didn't realize that my, I had a connecting flight. And I was actually in freaking Arizona. I had no idea. And so I run back through the airport, just laughing my head off. I'm telling security, I'm an idiot. And did you know we're in Arizona? Because I didn't. <laughs> um, and so I barely make it to my flight. We were in class and, um, and I used to do those beach body workouts, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, on the disc. And so there's like the late half naked lady on the disc, right? Mm -hmm. And so I'm in college class and it's back when the, um, the laptops held the discs, yeah. actually. And so anyways, we're in class, like everything's going, the teacher's talking. And um, we had to insert a new disc. And mm -hmm. so I took my old one out and um, it was the DVD disc. And it flew across the room, landed right in front of the professor. And there's this half-naked lady oh on it. <laughs> okay, so that's interesting. I know. <laughs> and so I, like, I was, I was so embarrassed. I walked down, picked it up, and just looked down the rest of the class. Oh, it was bad. That's hilarious. Okay, then yeah. that's all I have. Okay, I have actually another one now. Okay, so this was my very first class of college ever. And it was like 8 a.m. science class all the way across campus. And I walked forever to get there. And I was like positive thinking, oh, I can't wait to make friends and stuff in all my classes. And I go and sit down. And like five minutes before class starts, I get a tickle in my throat. And I, I had the worst coughing at all. And I'm just like, you know, like, my, I don't know, if, like, have you guys had a coughing at all? Uh -huh, oh, yeah. Uh -huh. So it's like a tickle in your throat, and you're like trying to. <laughs> <laughs> like it just gets so much more violent as the time goes on and so I'm like trying to like like discreetly cough it out and I'm like holding my breath to try to get it to go away 
and it never goes away. So I had to cough my way out of class <laughs> to go like <laughs> cough my lungs out in the hall. And then I come back in and then um, no one ever sat by me. <laughs> no one ever sat by me. <laughs> 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 minister. Are you kidding me? Jersey. <laughs> You probably have so I many no friends. It's so sad, but it's so funny. <laughs> you probably had so many nicknames. Oh, there's the hacking girl. <laughs> and I was probably like a deer in the headlights, terrified looking freshman. And I just cut my hair way too short. So the new <laughs> you. If you came here for mental health help, um, please go visit your doctor. If you're looking for um, some mental health tips, Dr. Daniel A. Men is someone I follow. I love what he has to say and offer. Um, I think his website is uh, brainhealthassessment.com, and he just has uh, some of the some awesome checklist items that go over brain health. So like checklist items for um, habits, habits that you should be doing to have better brain health. Um, I, don't know, I want to say there's like five to 10 items. And if you have those, if you're working on those habits and trying to improve them to improve your brain health, you'll also improve your happiness level because brain health equals mental health. So keep your brains happy and healthy. And check out Dr. Daniel Amen. This is not sponsored. I just really like what he has to say, and I think it's really beneficial. I think it can help a lot of people. Um, it's actually very matter of fact, um, kind of obvious, but yet we neglect so many of these habits daily. And I do feel like, um, you know, if you're feeling unhappy, that may be one of the reasons you're unhappy because you're ne neglecting your brain health. Um, which is also your men mental health and and yeah trying to improve these habits could really help so check him out uh if you have any stories from the 40s 50s 60s 70s and 80s please get in contact with me let's chat i want nothing more than to chat about the past want nothing more than to chat about the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. If you have any specific questions that I'm not asking that you would like to know about these eras while interviewing these people, please let me know. I would love some advice and I would love your input. So what would you guys like to know?